take a sound that's not stereo and try and spread it to be stereo. That, you you, you want to know why you're doing that? Because you didn't think about your stereo image at all. Now I want to talk about um, about stereo field because yeah. we're talking about, you know, oh, you can hard pan stuff. You can pan stuff 25 left, 25 right. And that's all very true. But I find the the more the better I get at mixing, the less I pan anything ever. Really? I find yes. the opposite. I mean, like sometimes like I will take a parallel channel of the exact same sound, put Haas effect on it, a slightly different distortion setting, and hard pan the two to create a width of equal and opposite measure of one sound and just completely get that sound out of my center, much like in old rock tracks or even really even new rock tracks, the rhythm guitarist will play twice Mm -hmm. that they'll play their part two times and they'll hard pan them and the subtle human differences in timing and tonality will create this beautiful stereo image leaving the center wide open for who the singer and the lead guitarist to rock out right down the middle mm -hmm. and i think that's really powerful but now instead of being like okay this shaker goes in the right ear and the tambourine goes in the left ear or whatever what i'll be like tambourine dog that's whack Bro, oh, tambourines I love tambourines, are tight, bro. man. I fucking My love fucking spice it up packs got some killer tambourine shots of porch for playing those killer tambourine shots that we put in that pack that's coming soon. Crap tambourine. <laughs> Tambo gang. Woo woo. Tambo gang. Shout out to Porch for the Tambos. Hey. Shout out Porch. <laughs> but like now I'll like think of it as like what what needs to be centered, what needs to be centered and wide, and what needs to be wide and not centered. Mm -hmm. And and in that way, like creating like varying degrees of width. And this is kind of similar to something. Uh, another thing I learned from you, Rip Kenny, is like, how do you make that bass sound sound so wide? Well, I purposefully contrasted it and checkerboarded it with a bass sound that was intentionally very not wide. So this bass sound hits and goes, gah, 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 and the wide ones. And then I've got this one that goes, Pew! right down the middle. And then it goes back to the wide one. And then that one sounds super wide because you know what narrow sounds like. Mm -hmm. And so I'll, I think more of like, okay, this sounds down the center and I'm going to put a little bit of this effect to give it a little bit of, stereo image and then this other sound i'm going to give a ton of stereo image and like eq down the mid eq on that sound so that i'm getting a ton of width and not a lot of center at all and then i also like having send effects with like auto pan type things on them and Haas effect type uh, type effects on those send effects so I can create a robust stereo image that evolves as it goes. So like instead of this hi-hats over here and that hi-hats over there, it's more like the hi-hats are moving and waving and wobbling around and never quite stay in one place. I, I in general would say that I agree with that philosophy. I try not to unbalance things too much but sometimes it just sounds nice one thing that i will frequently do um that i learned early on that i it's just one of those things i just love doing nowadays it's you got your kick and snare just right down broadway right and then your hi-hats a lot of people kind of leave them in the center but you can just move them like 10 percent to the left so like in ableton if you got 50 left and 50 right move it like five to eight left and and move something else in your hi-hats like five to eight right and that way they're not like dead center but if you want your drums to like be mostly centered and like hit down the middle they'll still kind of they'll get out of the way of the kick and snare a little bit and it just helps kind of you know like we we're talking about find find everything its own little lane doesn't have as long as it's not the exact same spot as something else um and I that's one thing that, that generally i think that people should be thinking about um in contrast to what you were just talking about is finding like a small amount of how to move things a little bit so that they're not right on top of each other i think one thing that i did early on that i fucked up trying to do what you were talking about is thinking everything needed to be balanced which basically meant 
everything is either right in the center or way out in the sides. And I didn't do a good job about like getting that nice spread of everything in between there. And it takes, it takes a skilled master with, you know, stereo. I, I, I hate to even mention stereo spreaders because if you don't know what you're doing, you're just going to crank this. St- like, I'm talking from experience here. Yeah. Hey, me too. Crank the stereo spreader on a bunch of shit. You might even be cranking the stereo spreader on a mono sound that can't be stereo anyways. And, and just ruining it uh, and making your mix sound like shit. Um, but you have to, you have to know what you're doing to be able to balance, put something 10% wide, put something 30% wide, 50% wide and hundred percent wide. So it's easier to kind of sometimes just kind of spread eight left, 10, right, 15 left, 25, right. With stuff that doesn't matter as much so that you can kind of hit all the individual lanes from center to full wide. Yeah. I like doing that with like, if I have big stacks of background vocals, like say it's yeah. an R and B track or something, or, you know, it's like an epic melodic build up to a, to a drop and it has a, the vocalist laid down a lot of layers and it's like, Oh, here's like the low octave and here's the middle backup layers. And here's the high octave and here's the harmony and here's harmony too. Then often I'll be like, okay, cool. Like I'll spread the low ones a little bit. And as it gets like higher up, you know, maybe like the, the mid, the, the regular one will be right down the center and the ones that are exactly like it will be hard panned. And then I'll like do the lows and the highs and the harmonies like in that fan, which gives each voice like its own little spot. And it feels like an entire choir is physically standing in front of you and you've got some of the singers are right in front of you and some of the singers are way down at the ends of the row yeah yeah i agree i agree with both of you guys on that i think definitely as you get more used to doing it you tend not to uh do things overly perfectly and overly extremely like i know before with with stereo imaging i would just do like 25 25 or 50 50 which on ableton is half of what it would be so like right between like 50 percent to 100 percent. but when i started to do little things like just set the hats off center a teensy bit i could hear how much it improved the transients of the kick and snare for example so like finding little spaces like that where the less important the element is the more fanned out it can get or for example one thing i love doing if there's like a vocal and a lead that's playing under it, and both are prominent in the chorus. Obviously, vocal has to take precedence in 99.9% of the times, but that lead I found never sounded quite right center. And then I would feel weird, like I had to add another sound equally on the opposite side if I were to pan it. And I have found for context like that, sometimes it's best to just I always save dead center for the most important elements and just do everything even a tiny smidgen off. But like even a lead in that situation, I would put like 25% to one side and just let it rock off center. And, you know, same thing. uh, That could be a form of consonance and dissonance, like I said. So just be aware of that. You don't always have to do that in every song. But there are situations where you're going to get a way better mix by just throwing out. I think it's just like an OCD thing of like, oh, I'm putting it to the left, so I, I must put one to the right. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know. I think I held myself back with that, and I know other people are going through the same thing. So just, just be aware of that. I think I, the one thing that I would be remiss not to mention here too, and I think this might – might be the most important thing that I've learned about stereo imaging. Um, the, the reason I was talking about stereo spreaders and how you just take a, take a sound that's not stereo and try and spread it to be stereo. That, you you, you want to know why you're doing that? Because you didn't think about your stereo image at all until you got to the very end. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, shit. Well, so- what do I force into the stereo field? <laughs> that shit does not work. The thing that, uh, that, that, that Luke was saying about the, the contrast of your sounds, one of them being 100% wide, one of them being 100% 
down the middle. Um, when you're doing a mud pie for your bass sounds and you're trying to come up with that really cool bass line, half your mud pie, do it with both your oscillators or one of your oscillators that has multiple voices detuned. That is a phase coherent way to get full width. Um, so do half your mud pie fully wide with all the chorus and hyper dimension in the world. And then do half your mud pie with one voice on every oscillator and, and back off the chorus and back off the hyper dimension. And that way, when you're actually going to sequence these parts, you have both extremes mm -hmm. and you can go back and forth and find your favorite bits from each and then be like, okay, how could I tastefully make it so they go back and forth? Um, that's, that's tough to remember before you understand how important it is, mm -hmm. but it's one of those things that like, as I would continually get to the end of a song and realize my stereo field was piped, I would, uh, <laughs> when I'm writing a song, I'm like, oh yeah, I don't want to do that again. And then intentionally make the parts. I have, I have an idea in mind for where they're going to sit in the stereo mm -hmm. field later. So, um, it's, it's kind of a chicken before the egg thing, but if you can remember when you're writing the song, don't, don't obsess over it. You don't want to go into engineering brain, but if you can remember when you're writing the song, give yourself some options of stereo and mono. You can figure it out later then. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, chicken before the egg, but the more you actually practice the process of song production to completion, Whereas you do all the writing and arranging parts, and then you do the mixing and mastering parts. If you go through that process enough and you keep running into the same problem, like shit, no stereo image. Eventually, that I keep forgetting stereo image will be baked into your brain to the point where you effortlessly start to think about what are some wide elements I can write with right at the beginning because you're tired of running into the same dumb problem at the end. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's probably about how all of us learn to do that shit by doing it poorly a bunch of times until we stop forgetting. I like it. What's up, humans? It's Luke, your friendly neighborhood trap Jesus. Thanks so much for watching the podcast, checking out our videos. We truly appreciate you. So, Rip Kenny, Tesco, and myself got you a gift. We made you a free sample pack. It's got basses, it's got FX, it's got crazy percussion and Foley sounds, and it's free. It's all yours. Just click the link in the description below. Also, make sure to hit that subscribe, hit that like button, and share this with your friends. We appreciate you. Peace out and peace among worlds.